since the killing of George Floyd, we've seen a big push for diversity and for anti-racism training um, across all kinds of institutions. So my question to the three of you is, you know, what do you make of these demands and how they're framed? What do you think they really mean by diversity and anti-racism? And what do you make of this approach? Is it helpful? Um, and finally, it's a big question. What are the implications this has for your work? Now, in one stance, I'm I'm excited that people want to have these conversations because goodness knows they're they're certainly overdue. Um, but I'm also very concerned that this will be a check the box situation for organizations and schools and companies. Um, I'm also concerned by the fact that there are a lot of people out there who are presenting diversity and inclusion initiatives and programs and workshops that are, are still doing it in a way that is not helping the situation, but in fact, causing more division and polarization. And we need to really redefine and rethink how we have these conversations, because it's not like this is new. You know, having diversity initiatives is not a new thing. It's been happening since the civil rights era. But if it has been effective, wouldn't we be in a much different place than we are now? Um, I think the language that we use needs to be um, re-examined. Um, you know, the, the whole idea of being anti-racist, while I understand that's a, a positive, I think just instantly considering someone racist just because they are not a person of color, I think that's very detrimental. And we're gonna open ourselves up to a whole world of trouble. Six months ago, if you had asked me this question, I would have, and I did, I you know, write a blog for Inside Higher Education where I have deeply questioned the stridency of much diversity work, although I consider myself what I like to call a diversity progressive myself. And now part of the question I'd like to raise is, did, did that stridency accomplish something? Did its kind of uncompromising stance of basically pay attention to police violence against black people, pay attention to police violence against black people. It means that those of us who didn't really want to pay that much attention could not view the George Floyd moment as an anomaly. It was not an exception. What I considered stridency in an uncompromising approach to diversity issues about which I was very uncomfortable some months ago, wrote frequently about how much I disliked it those people created a mental category in which the George Floyd moment does not strike our minds as an anomaly, it strikes ourselves, our minds as an embodiment. And if there hadn't been noise about Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown and Laquan McDonald, and we all know how long and egregious that list is, I think what would have happened with George Floyd is what happened with Rodney King, which is this is a terrible one-off. And instead, the mental category was created and we viewed it as, wow, it, it's the dot that creates a narrative of everything else. And that's for people like me who are a little bit slow to the table. So this is, it's a different answer than I would have given six months ago, right? It's a very different answer than I would have given six months ago. Um, and I'm happy about that. I think that part of what intellectuals do is they revise their views based on the evidence at hand. Of course, there is racism. Of course, there is classism. Of course. You know why I say of course? Because we're human beings. We are utterly imperfect. We think first with our emotions and therefore with our egos. And only if we are encouraged and reminded and skilled enough do we learn to transcend the primal part of our brain in order to tap the more evolved and reasoning part of our brain. That takes an intentional effort. You bet. All of these prejudices are with us. It's not just about white people or about brown people being anti-black. If in that conference of esteemed practiced diversity practitioners. This was the first year that disability was mentioned and then it came from a kid. Then frankly, black people also have to look at their biases. And I can assure you that there aren't nearly 
the protests for the equality of people with disabilities that there are for people of color. So yes, we're all complicit. And I look forward to the day when those of us who advocate for diversity, before telling others to check their biases, will offer up our own. I really think that if those of us who love to lecture other people about how they have to grow, role modeled that growth openly and repeatedly. And I thank my friend Ibu for pointing out that six months ago, he wouldn't have been in the place of growth that he is today. That's humility. We need more of it. And we need it among black people and brown people and indigenous people and not just among white people. What do you think about the lines that are being drawn in the diversity conversation right now? To, to whose benefit and who's being left out and what might the implications of that be? I don't think that the George Floyd moment would have rocked the world the way it did or should have had it not been for eight years of strident activism. Basically, in your face, you will recognize my categories. I will not listen to the other facts you want to bring up, et cetera, et cetera. And I am grateful for that. And it is against my kind of character and intellectual temperament to say, uh, because you were in my face for eight years, you forced me to create a mental category, which was in the middle of my mind, right? The violence that police officers commit against black people and the George Floyd moment brought it to the front and the center. And I could not say, but what about all these other things, right? And so I think the reason I bring up geeky things like modes of discursivity is I think that that actually lives alongside the other things that I value, right? So I do value democratic. I'm not going back on my valuing of, hmm, what do you think about things, right? I often say, uh, um, you know, I, I'm not buying a cupcake from the KKK bake sale but I'm talking to everybody else. And I highly value that, right? And I, I, was, uh, I was deeply disappointed in myself that I had no idea about the devastation of the opioid, opioid epidemic. And that's because I'm a well-educated brown person who lives in a city. Totally ignored rural white folks for decades and decades. But I think that there is a value to strident, ideologically driven, critical theory based activism that I did not recognize until these past couple of months. Can I ask a question? And I'll ask no. it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Non-Stridency. Um, I'll ask this both of Kareth and Ibu, given what, you've just, uh, what we've just heard from Ibu. If there's value in the strident critical race theory approach, is there also therefore value in the shaming that goes with it? Kareth, what do you think? I, I love that you brought that up. Uh, absolutely not. You know, I don't know anyone who has changed their mind or their ways by being shamed. Not any of my children, not my husband, no politicians, certainly not students and folks in corporate America. Um, that's probably the worst thing that we could do. That's the worst way to approach this. Um, it's, I know that you and I ag agree on this. Um, you, there are certainly ways to bring people's attention to these matters without getting in the face and saying, you need to see it this way and understand. And if you don't, you're a horrible person and you're evil and you're bad. You know, people are not going to understand certain things until they've experienced it. And not everybody's gonna experience everything the same exact way, which is why we need to implore what I call, I call it caring. I say, when I speak, I want people to care, which is have conscious empathy. You know, active listening, you know, not just hearing what someone says, but interpreting, taking time to let it marinate. Um, responsible reactions, how you respond is everything between creating a conversation that can go somewhere or creating an arch enemy. 
And of course, environmental awareness, which is what Ibu was talking about. You know, the fact that we just haven't been aware of our environment outside of our little bubbles, whether it is rural America who's suffering from an opioid epidemic or people who are brown who, you know, live in poverty and have diabetes because the diets they've been given for generations now have been crap. Um, you know, the reality is we, we, we are all the stars of our own one person play as my theater professor used to say. And now it's time to step out into the audience and talk to one another and listen. And it has to start with that. Are we gonna all leave singing Kumbaya and holding hands? Of course not. But to get these conversations, and that's what people don't know. People do not know how to communicate effectively right now. Like, I don't feel diversity and inclusion workshops should be about diversity. It should be about how to talk to one another and how to listen and how to hear and grasp someone else's experience so that you see where they're coming from. And I, you know, I, that's why I admire you so much in the work that you do. Um, you know, we're, we're so much on the same page with this. Um, and and I, slowly, I think people are catching up, but you, all, you also said something, or shot about changing people's minds. Something I've learned recently is about the heart, the human heart. Like we think it's just this muscle that, that, that pumps blood through our bodies. Like that's it. We thought we've known everything about the heart for years because we've been giving, doing heart transplants, but the heart is actually, it has over 40,000 neuroreceptors, which means it, it has its own brain. It's a little brain. It can think independently and feel and empathize separately from our minds. So what we have to do is start connecting the heart and the brain and touching people's hearts when we go and we speak. And it sounds woo woo and it sounds like kind of out there in new age, but that's the only way we are really going to effectively come together in unity and have peace and have people able to effectively communicate. The point is, is that you are in the space. The vast majority of people, particularly those who need to be convinced, are not in that space. And not only do they not take kindly to being singled out, shamed, scorned, and mocked, but as Kareth was pointing out, those kinds of tactics actually backfire. What I find so fascinating, folks, is that, you know, here we are in the midst of a pandemic and public health officials since the AIDS epidemic and possibly even before, have known that in order to change behaviors, you've got to meet people where they are. Diversity practitioners by and large and anti-racism activists by and large ignore that principle. But if it's true for public health, why would it not be true? for the pandemic that people have, are calling racism. Is it wrong of me to wish that I had um, more white male students for the sake of diversity? Um, and why is this not considered a problem by anyone else? I'll jump in and say that, uh, no, I don't think it's wrong for him to hope for more demographic diversity. Um, the fact of the matter is that you know, white people are part of the tapestry of, uh, of 21st century America. Um, what, I, what I'm working towards is a world in which, you know, people are seen not as white, black, brown, or any other particular label, but rather as ironically, and perhaps contradictorily here, as one label, and it is this, it's not even human, it is plural that each and every one of us is a plural. And that means that the fact that Iwu, Irshad, and Amna have come from Muslim heritage, however it is that we identify ourselves now, does not mean that we think the same. There are many sides to each of us, including the so-called white straight guy. And that if all we're doing is seeing people for the color of their skin or their sexual orientation or their gender identity or uh, their religion, 
and I know that's not what Ibu is talking about here, but if that's what, what we are reducing people to, then we're not actually appreciating the deeper diversity within affinity or identity groups. So uh, to cut to the chase, I don't hold it against the professor for wanting that much more diversity. And if in his context, or hers, but I think you said him, in, if in his context, that means a few more white people, to my mind, that is not racist. But what I would love to see this professor do is get to know individuals for the pluralism that they represent beyond uh, whatever meets the eye. We're focusing so much on diversity. What about focusing on what we have in common? And that's actually the approach that I take. I, I, I coined the term inversity because I think it's really important that we, of course, address the history and experiences and the individual uh, wonderful qualities that we all bring to the table, but we should shift the focus from what separates and divides us, which is traditional DNI stuff, to what do we have in common? How can we be truly inclusive of one another? But most importantly, being introspective meaning understanding one's value, one's worth, one's connection to humanity. Because I feel like that's really where we get to the heart of the matter. Because when you can focus on those things inside of yourself, then you can see them in someone else. When you understand your value and worth, then you can see the value and worth of another person, regardless of their ability, their sexual identity, their religion, their skin color. Um, it, it has to be, it has to start with you first. We've been working from the outside in, now it's time to work from the inside out. And, and if I may just quickly add, I think, Kareth, that is what I am, what I think, viewing one another as plurals right away. No analysis needed. The fact that you are an individual who may, you know, voluntarily or, uh, or, or uh, mandatorily be, uh, you know, part of other groups is neither here nor there. You are a plural. I am a plural. The professor who asked the question is a plural. And that before I even know anything about you, is what we have in common. Irshad, you were a strident mm -hmm. Muslim yes. lesbian activist for a decade. Right. Like you were basically like, you're gonna deal with my lesbianness, uh, Muslim community or else. Can I, and, and part of what you do in Don't Label Me is you say, I don't wanna be that person anymore. And yeah. you know why, Ibu? Can I just quickly say? Yes, because you but then I wanna thank you for me. something. What? You had a talk with me. You had a talk with me years ago in which you showed the care and the kindness that I was rarely treated to by other Muslims. And you took me under your wing and you talked to me like a sister, like me being a sister to you. Oh, I'm getting that, a little chills. That's so sweet. That's the no, nicest no, no. thing anybody's no, no, no. ever said. You know, goosebumps or no goosebumps. The point is that what Kareth is talking about genuinely sincerely conversing with one another, caring about one another, asking questions, listening, hearing our backstory, taking the time to respect. Respect comes from the Latin word respectate, which means to look again and not stop at a first impression. That's what you did, Ibu. And I've never forgotten that. And I will tell you, it had the kind of impact on my life and on my work that gave me the permission to communicate with others in the way that Kareth has been speaking to. Just that one conversation. So what's interesting is that while you may have been changed because of stridency, I was changed because of kindness. <laughs>